Good morning. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to venture into Luke chapter 22. Uh, this chapter is very dense with concepts and truths and, and what we see in God's character. A lot of those things will be brought out today. So the focus is as we go through this scripture that we're going to cover, focuses on uh, living without fear, praying continually, uh, reliance on the Lord, and not in our own self-confidence, and then God's character and His grace. So, this chapter starts out with Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. So let us start here with verse 1. Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were lurking, looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how they might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. They, he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. So three points with this first section here. Fear of the people, as we see the religious leaders of that time for some reason feared the people, and most of the time when they interacted and seen Jesus, he was with a group of people, a large crowd, and they didn't want to do it at this time. So it's something that we can see potentially in today's church. We see that, you know, church leaders are, are scared of the people. They fear what the people think or will do, and hopefully not, but can cater to the people's wants and not following what God wants. So what should we do? We should not fear the people of this world. And why should we not have to fear them? It's because we have Jesus, Jesus in our lives. And when we have him, we are not to fear. Fear is a thing of this world. The only fear we should have is for our own salvation and a fear of the Lord Almighty, not a fear of worldly things. And Jesus is telling us here not to fear. When we speak, we should be speaking the words of truth, the truth of God. It has consequences, but God is with us and behind us in speaking his truths. Jesus will take care of us. So second point here, Satan enters Judas. So evil, evil things, evil thoughts in our mind, evil things come over us. That is Satan at work. Satan at work trying to infiltrate our lives, infiltrate the temple of God. Do you let evil things live in your temple? Does it control you? Tell you what to do? You are subjected to temptation, even in salvation. So even once you find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will still be tempted. Don't think that you're immune to it. It actually can be more intense. And you must keep your temple clean, so don't let the evil thoughts in, as Judas did here. Don't let Satan into your life, lives. The third thing was money. Money was the cost. Money was the cost of this betrayal. What is the cost you have for the money you obtain in your daily life? Does the way you obtain it push your ethics? Worldly things can be very overpowering. But the way to approach it, do works for God and you will be blessed. Don't work for the riches of the world, because they are only for a season. Just think about something that you buy. How long is that thing new and shiny? How long is it filling that void that makes you feel good for how, having it? It doesn't take long till stuff that is worldly to rust, to fade, to rot, to obtain dents. To stop working, and the next thing you know, we're discarding it, and we're on to the next worldly thing. It never fulfills our need. That need and wanting we have in our hearts is for the Lord. What eternal value does it have, those worldly things? It has no eternal value. A relationship with the Lord, however, is just the opposite. It only continues to grow and continues to prosper. It has that eternal value. 
on to the next section, the Last Supper, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened and bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So this festival celebrates the journey of the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And saying to the owners of the house, the teacher asked, Where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and fell things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And this is the establishment of communion. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table, and the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you will be like that, be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer to you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But as I pray for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, that is written about me as reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Notice what happened at the Feast of Unleavened and Bread. There is a need for the Passover lamb in that celebration. His body and his blood for us. He is the ultimate and final sacrifice, the only way our sins can be forgiven. We share in communion in remembrance of his sacrifice for us. The first thought in that section. Next, who is the greatest? Jesus multiple times discusses this. It is not about the best, the greatest, or our pride. It's about humility. We are to be servants in Christ. Worldly ambition of being the greatest is not a character of a follower of Christ. Our example, which is Jesus, took upon him the form of a servant and humbled himself to be to, to the death on the cross. As we obtain eternal happiness, walking with the Lord, 
we must expect to be attacked and assaulted by Satan. He'll fight to destroy us. And if he can't destroy us, he'll try to disgrace us and distress us. Nothing can more quickly bring down a believer than self-confidence. Unless we are watching and praying always, this can happen. We need to have reliance on the Lord instead of self-confidence in ourselves. We must always rely on Jesus. If believers are left to themselves, they would fall. But if we're kept, we are kept by the power of God in the prayer of Christ for us. Next, it speaks of Peter and his denial of Christ three times. This is an example of not continually keeping your eye on the Lord and walking with him always. Just like Peter, he quickly fell away to the world. As a flesh man, I am so thankful for his grace. Jesus then emphasizes, when we have him, we need nothing. Lastly here, he wants us to be ready for spiritual warfare. We need the sword of the Spirit in the times after his death, burial, and resurrection. In these times. And these times will be tough, he alludes to. And you must not stray from the Lord, but keep your eyes on him and your focus on him, asking to do his will daily. Going on to the next section, Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. This is a place he went away from the crowds to have time to pray and talk to the Father. Jesus went on, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he went back to the disciples and found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Of many things here, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of prayer. He's leading by example. He himself is praying. Praying that the Lord's will will be done. Praying for strength. Praying asking that the disciples pray to fight against temptation. He says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Each day we need to ask this in our lives, that we will be doing the Lord's will, not our will. Even Jesus needed strength. He emphasizes to pray more earnestly, not to be in sorrow, but to rejoice in what God has given you. How important is it each day to talk to other people? We do it for many reasons. To complete tasks, to relay feelings, to comfort people, to plan, to work to solve problems. We do that by open communication with other people. Well, just think how valuable our conversations with others are. How much stuff do we get accomplished because of these conversations. Well, we must be having these same conversations with the Lord. That is what Jesus is alluding to here. Well, how do we have these conversations with the Lord? We pray continually. That's our conversation with the Lord. We need to open that communication back and forth to where each thing in our lives we do, we have that reliance on God to lead and guide us, to help us in our everyday lives with each and everything that we do. 
Just imagine what you and the Lord can accomplish if you talk to each other. The next section is Jesus arrested. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and a man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was happening, he said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this, and touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and the elders who came had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have came with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but in your hour, but but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Here, don't confuse what Jesus has asked you to do. The disciples misunderstood him related to swords. As we see with the injury that occurred from utilization of that sword. The hour of darkness reigns on the Mount of Olives. This begins the dark times of his torture and death. But don't be sorrowed. This is only for a short time. We will see his triumph with his resurrection. On to verse 54, this talks about Peter's disowning of Jesus. When seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. He was no longer right beside the Lord. And when some that had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated in the firelight, looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I do not know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him. You are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted. Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I do not know you're about. You're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Oh, our moments of weakness, even in closeness, just as Peter has with the Lord, we can be weak. But don't be discouraged. Keep pressing on. Remember God's character. The love for a child. You are his child. In the last three scriptures we're going to go through today before we stop. The guard mocks Jesus. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who will hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. These people who are doing this, they're a very rebellious people who have rejected the Lord. If you look in Isaiah 1, it goes into detail related to kind of the lineage and who these people are. But these were blasphemers, the priests and the followers of them who were addicted to these brutalities that they utilized. What we need to remember from this scripture, remember that the world is full of evil and it's always attempting to to tempt, tempt and deceive you. But what we must do is put our reliance on the Lord and not in ourselves. We have to have that open communication, that praying continually to the Lord. If you fall like Peter, get up, dust yourself off, and proceed on. God is a God of love. He loves his children. Be a child of Christ. Let us close with a prayer. We ask you for strength, not to fear the things of this world. Our reliance is on you, O Lord. We long to walk with you daily and to focus on you. Help us to develop our conversations with you. 
to be open and understanding of your will in our lives. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for your grace. Amen.